When my work as a case manager and a coordinator for the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force, I did presentations, and in these presentations about human trafficking, talking about what's happening globally to a national level and then to the local level, there were two really interesting responses that I would hear. The first, disbelief and shock. Shock that it's happening and shock that it's happening locally. And the second, what do we do to help? How do we respond? What do we need to do tomorrow to change this? And I'll tell you that both responses concern me a little, and that may come as a surprise. But at this point, what I've concluded is that we as a society are not yet ready to abolish modern day slavery. And I want to share why that is and what we need to do about it. There's a young woman, she gets out of a car and back out on the track. A few cars begin lapping around, checking out the new merchandise. Within the next hour, she'll be in and out of four other vehicles. The last vehicle with an unexpected surprise, a UC, an undercover officer, that wonders how old she really is. He takes her back to the station, and at the station, asks her what her name is. How old are you? What are you doing? Where are you from? Who's making you do this? And she responds, sitting back across from him, fidgety, antsy, pissed. And he can see on her face that every minute that is passing is a dollar slipping through her fingers. She responds, my name's Brittany, I'm 19, I'm from around here, I'm not working for anybody, I do this myself. He notices a tattoo along her neck and knows that it's a name of a local pimp, so he asks about it. Oh, this? It's just my daddy's name. So what do we think? Is Brittany a victim or a criminal? On the other side of town, there's a garment factory that is employing men and women from Thailand. This garment factory is surrounded by barbed wire, has around-the-clock armed guards, and the employees work 18-hour day shifts seven days a week. They're all here illegally. Are they victims? Or are they criminals? It may come to a surprise to us that it wasn't until the year 2000 that we actually had laws about modern day slavery. And we know them now as the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. They were giving laws and language and definitions so that law enforcement could investigate crimes of trafficking and prosecutors to bring justice upon traffickers. And it was that sad and haunting reality that we needed to put teeth back into our 13th Amendment, that we are not a nation of slavery, but yet somehow slavery has rebirthed itself and we're needing new tools in order to combat it. And yet despite these laws, what I have learned in this field is that it is extremely difficult to determine crimes of trafficking and the victims of trafficking. But what I have come to understand, I've learned through the movie Shrek, Who'd have thought? And there's this pivotal point in the movie Shrek where Shrek is talking with Donkey. And Shrek is trying to convince Donkey about what ogres are like. And Shrek says, ogres are like onions. They have lots of layers. And the crimes of trafficking the victims of trafficking and the realities of the systems in which they live in have lots of layers. And for order uh, for us to truly combat this system, we need to look at the root and the layers within it. And so I wanna take us back to the garment factory. This garment factory was raided by law enforcement and then covered by the Los Angeles Times, and it's what we know now today as the 1995 El Monte Sweatshop within Los Angeles County. 
were 72 men and women from Thailand, 67 of them women, were enslaved, forced, threatened, paid little to nothing, and trapped. There was no question about their victimization. Yet the girl on the track, Brittany, she doesn't seem forced. She doesn't seem trapped. She's concerned about the money she's not making. Is Brittany a victim or a criminal? And if we were to read in the newspaper tomorrow, we would read somewhere in the text, teen prostitute. And I have to tell you, when I say those words, that shudders in my soul. Because I have a hard time understanding how teen and prostitute go together. And as I've wrestled with that, what I've come to, to question is, how does a child have the authority to even get into that situation? And does a child have the cognitive ability to make such a decision? And how did the child become the criminal and the adult a customer? And as I've wrestled with those questions, I've come to realize one defining factor, money. This transaction of money creates a teen prostitute and an adult customer. If we were to remove money from the equation, we would have a child sexual assault victim and a statutory rapist. Is Brittany a victim or is she a criminal? And I know the question's probably then wrestling through all of our brains is, well, then how does a child even get in within these systems? If it is so complicated, if it is so difficult, then how does it even happen? And there are pathways into this, into entrance. And one common pathway to entrance is this idea of being kidnapped. And it's what we've heard probably more likely when the media covers human trafficking and covers crimes against children is this idea of being kidnapped and not because Kidnapping has this shock value, but because, let's be honest, it just makes a little bit more sense that you were kidnapped and then you were forced as a sex slave. It doesn't make it right, but it makes it make more sense to our psyche. But I will tell you that the common, more honest and more pr prone to pathway is slow grooming, slow coercion, and it happens earlier on. And the closest analogy that I can kind of come to represent is this idea of cooking the frog in the kettle. And I've never cooked a frog in a kettle, but if those of you were to Google it today, you would find directions and even YouTube videos of how to cook a frog in the kettle. So I looked at one and I realized that you, couldn't, you don't throw a frog into boiling water. We all know why. Instinctively, that frog knows to jump out. You put a frog into room temperature and you gradually turn up the heat the frog accepts every degree of heat, accepts every degree of warmth. That is the slow grooming, slow coercion of children like Brittany. That it started at a much earlier age. And Brittany, let's go back to five years old. Brittany comes home from school with her siblings and dad is home. And everybody flees for safety because when dad is home, it is violent. He is abusive, he's aggressive, and mom usually takes the brunt of it all. And if she doesn't, they'll be hit, they'll be beat at some point. But what Brittany is now linking together, seeing her parents, is love and abuse are tied hand in hand. And what her family doesn't realize is happening is that uncle has been visiting during this time. And while uncle's been visiting, he's been sexually abusing Brittany. And so Brittany, at the big age of five, has a big decision. Does she share or does she keep it to herself? And let's say in this scenario, Brittany shares. She tells her parents, 
her parents have two responses, to believe or not to believe. And then let's say they believe. What I've heard from so many survivors is, your uncle's done that to all of us. We just don't tell your grandma. But either way, the damage is done. Brittany, we cannot escape what's happened. We cannot rewind. And we have a child that now links love, sex, and abuse hand in hand. Do you feel the kettle in her pot turning up a little bit? And yet, at the age of 11, she gets to a point where I'm done. And she knows that she has two decisions. I'm either going to stay, and I'm going to stay with this violence and this situation and the thoughts of my uncle, or I'm going to go. And I'm going to go over there because I'm going to make my dreams happen. I'm going to be something, and it's going to be better than what's here. And you and I are both now processing and saying, no, Brittany has a lot of other decisions besides two. But we need to remember that 11 years old, the dendrites aren't all connecting yet. And we know now, based on research, that we don't have mature brains until we're 26 years old, which means Brittany is making very big decisions based on an inability to do cause and effect. And experience plus experience equals wisdom. She doesn't have that. So she sees two options. And she's going to choose the latter and believe that out there has something better than what's in here. And 2.8 million other children run away from home every single year in our country. And a third of whom are going to be picked up for some form of commercial sex act within 48 hours of them leaving home. What does that mean? That means for Brittany to get from here to there, she may trade sex for that transportation ride. Survival, trade sex for food, a bed night stay. That kettle's getting pretty warm. And then she'll meet a group of people, and maybe those people will introduce her to him, or maybe she'll just meet him. And he will rock her world because he will ask her all the questions she's been dying to be asked. The simple ones. How are you? How are you doing? What do you dream about? And for the first time, do you know what Brittany's thinking to herself? Somebody's listening to me. And why he's listening? He's taking her out to eat. She's dining at places she's never seen or dreamed of. He's buying her designer clothes, getting her hair done. And do you know what Brittany feels like for the first time? A princess. And she finally feels special and feels noticed. And yet what she can't see, because she's 11, is that when the honeymoon is over, she won't realize that from this point forward, she will constantly be lying about her age. She will have changed her name as many times as she's changed cities. And mind you, we change cities a lot because that messes up jurisdictionally for law enforcement, for prosecution cases. And when you move a child from city to city to city, who do they know? Who will they trust? They will continue to trust him. She doesn't know that her family will be threatened and her life will be threatened. She doesn't know that she will be raped repeatedly. She doesn't know that she will be beaten for not bringing in enough money. You see why she's stressed at the police station? She doesn't know that she will get an STD or two or three. And she doesn't know that she will be arrested again and again and again. And that's where I met Brittany. I was at the police station and Brittany was only 13. So is Brittany a victim or a criminal. And there are 200,000 Britneys, American youth, at risk of being commercially sexually exploited every year. So what do we do? We have a penal justice system that designed at its very best sees black and white. We have a child that will become an adult who has been broken 
down in life, who has been beaten down systematically. And we have to wonder, what is life for them? What we can do is we can choose to not buy in to the media's black and white. And I'm not saying that the media is bad. They give us information in sound bites. And so the simplest thing to cover a story about Brittany is what? Label her a teen prostitute. But we see that damage in those two words and that language that it's creating and convoluting. And even in that labeling, if we can battle our inner self to not objectify. When we objectify the woman on the corner, when we objectify the homeless person on the street, when we objectify the woman dropping her child off at school with bruises along her, and when we objectify the child that's truant without unpacking their onion, without seeing the layers that hold, we can continue to say teen prostitute then. But what we can choose to do, which will give hope to Brittany, is to fight against that urge to objectify and to see that there are layers amongst all of these faces that pass us every day. And when we begin to do that, we begin to give hope to the Brittany's. And I want to thank you for traveling on this journey and quest of what is justice and finding hope. Thank you.